Hello ladies and gentlemen, welcome to another thing where I talk about things. Today, I would like to talk about music. Music from a couple different perspectives. Uh, I've got some news regarding the Mentally Advanced series. We had our outro track for the Mentally Advanced series and Rainbow Dash Presents. Uh, it was pirated by a company called The Orchard Music. They're kind of notorious for doing this sort of thing. What The Orchard Music does is they upload like public domain performances or stuff in the Creative Commons into Content ID and then they use that to seize people's videos and they steal your ad revenue. And, uh, and, you know, they're doing this to us right now. So, uh, we're going to talk a little bit about that. And then we're going to talk about the things that I'm doing to circumvent that. And then we're going to talk about when I was in band back in high school. Because uh, this stuff, it, it, all, it all leads into each other. Um, anyway, though, what we're going to start with is that uh, I use Sony Acid to make a lot of our background music. Uh, I do some custom things and I use loops and stuff like that. The way that it works is people put stuff up for Creative Commons or you get like a royalty-free license. For example, you can buy packs of loops online and then you can use them to make music. Uh, Sony Acid also has their own packs of loops that you can buy and sell. Um, however, I'm finding that those that license on YouTube is, is basically worthless. It doesn't have a lot of value um, because what happened was I used a, a synth loop that came with the standard Sony Acid package. This was way back when I first got started. Like I bought Sony Acid, I made the Mentally Advanced series, I made the outro for it, very first video. This outro has been with us for, for pretty much the very birth of this YouTube channel for years. And, uh, and in 2014, I think is what it was, it looked like some guy uploaded a song that used the Mentally Advanced uh, uh, they, they use Synth9, is what it is, was, this is the name of the loop. Uh, it used Synth9, he uploaded this on the internet. And recently, or, or I don't know if it's recently or if maybe Content ID has gotten a little bit more sensitive, but, but recently this apparently has gotten onto Content ID. So we've been using this, this outro for years and uh, this guy has just started claiming music um, through the Orchard Music. So what the Orchard Music does is as soon as Content ID snags something, in this case, our outro song by, uh, by invalidating the Sony creative license that they give you, um, what they then do is they, they just take all your ad revenue and they put up links and they say like, this belongs to Sony, Sony Orchard and they advertise themselves. It's all great for them. It's all pretty much an act of piracy. Uh, then what you're supposed to do is you would dispute the claim. And I've actually had this happen with CD Baby and also another group called Believe Music. And as far as I can tell, the Orchard Music, among those three, these three that I've had problems with, uh, the Orchard Music is the most malicious of the three. What uh, Believe Music did was uh, um, they actually, just after I disputed the claim, it sat there in dispute for a little while. And while your video's being disputed, nobody earns any money. Like, they don't run ads at all. YouTube is just like, oh, I don't know. We're frightened. We don't want to earn any. No, nobody earns any money. Nobody earns anything. So uh, after I disputed for a while, Believe Music eventually reviewed the dispute and then they lifted the claim because uh, when, you're using, when you're using loops like that, you know, you get, you get false hits, you get false positives sometimes. And it's, it's kind of a funny thing because it's like I've gotten false positives on some videos but not others. So you just, you just dispute them and eventually they, they lift the claim because there's no, I mean it's not the same songs. You know, they don't have copyright on the loops. Someone else owns the rights to that. It's either Creative Commons or whatever. Um, so they would lift it. What the Orchard Music does, though, is it appears, it appears that they automatically uh, reject your dispute. And they say, no, no, we own the song. We own this. We own this loop. You know, it doesn't matter that we don't own the loop. We own the loop. And what this does is it allows them to continue to earn ad revenue on your videos. What they want you to do, apparently, is manually email them about your video and tell them, hey, uh, you're pirating you know, ad revenue from my song. And so then like they, they sit on your email for a while for however long it takes, like a week, a month, I don't even know. And then eventually they might get back to you and say, oh, how silly, we pirated like the whole first month of your income, which is gonna be like the bulk of your income on that video. Uh, you know, so we made, you know, like, oh, you got 20,000 views. Well, that was $20 that we made. We'll go ahead and we'll release your video now that you've paid us $20. Um, so it's, it's, it's exploiting the incredibly broken Content ID system. Content ID is, is a little bit notorious for this. They facilitate piracy in a phenomenal and brave new way. Um, it's, it's, it's amazing how big of a problem this is. Because I've mentioned before in a past video, that the Content ID system causes piracy 
in such a way that the court systems can't actually deal with it. A group like The Orchard Music, what they do is they commit small acts of piracy like this all over YouTube. They'll like seize your video, they take some of your ad revenue, then they give the video back. And so from me they take like $20, and from somebody else they take like $10, and another guy like $1, then someone else like $30, you know, it just depends on how well the videos are doing. And so they, they steal small amounts of money from all over YouTube, and it adds up, you know, and it makes them a pretty substantial, you know, amount of money. And then, you know, maybe a lot of their claims aren't valid, but it doesn't matter, because it's like, you know, what am I going to do? I'm not going to take a, a, a company to court over $20, and neither is anybody else. Your only hope would be a class action lawsuit. But when you get into a class action lawsuit with copyright, you find that the court system is actually not able to look at, like, thousands of claims and evaluate whether or not the copyrights were valid on everything. So, you know, like, you can't, you really can't gather together, like, a thousand people. Because you steal, like, ten dollars from a thousand people, and that's ten thousand dollars. And that's enough to go to court over, maybe, or, or like, you know, a hundred thousand, like, ten thousand people, that's a hundred thousand dollars. And it just, you know, like I say, it adds up. Everybody, you steal ten dollars from everybody, and you wind up with a fair amount of money. So if you try to get 10,000 people, or what, what I read was they tried to get 1,000 people on a class action lawsuit, uh, not against Orchard Music, as I recall. I think it might have been against YouTube in general. Um, but if you try to get like 1,000 people together for a class action lawsuit, you find that the court system can't handle it. They can't evaluate 1,000 different copyright claims. So this is what keeps Orchard Music going. This is how, they, this is how uh, Content ID facilitates piracy, and this is uh, what the Orchard Music is taking advantage of. They're just exploiting a really broken system uh, to commit a lot of piracy. Uh, so anyway, though, they're going to continue to claim the outro, and in fact, I expect this to come back and be a problem. At uh, some point down the line, what you're going to find is that uh, the Rainbow Dash Presents series and all the old Mentally Advanced series that are still online, they're probably going to get little bite-sized chunks taken out of the outro of all of them because I'm going to have to remove that synth 9 loop from the outro every time uh, the Orchard Music tries to claim one of those videos because they they won't honor the dispute or if they do they're only they're only going to honor it after they take a you know like a week or a month of, of my income or whatever uh, and then, you know, it's, it's just going to be a problem. So what I'm going to do is I'm just going to use the YouTube system that removes music from your stuff. And uh, we'll just <laughs> remove a chunk of the outro because it's the fastest and, and most uh, realistic way that I'm going to be able to take care of that. Now, that said, after getting burned on that, I, I now kind of view the Sony creative license as, as having very little value. Because the other thing that I found out that this is really fascinating was that Sony just recently purchased the Orchard Music. So you've even got this conflict of interest where Sony sold me this creative software, you know, with a license stating that I could use their loops uh, to make background music. And then one of these, this branch, this, this company that they own then turns around and uh, claims that loop and then they take money from it, like they, they just take the whole video. And not just like a small amount of royalties for that 30 seconds of looping that they found, but they're taking like the whole video. And so Sony is now suddenly getting money from this company, you know, doing... So there's a conflict of interest there, and, and it, it causes me to develop a very dim view on the whole Sony Creative software. So what I've done is I've gone out and I've bought a, a, a new set of software, and this is called Studio One. This is actually a very common software for recording. A lot of people use it. Um, but Studio One is a sort of instrument synthesizer program. And what I've done in the past is I've used loops and people will, uh, will upload things like, for example, there's a, like a Philharmonica package that's full of, of uh, sound samples of like, you know, you play an instrument and it's like it, you know, you hold out and it's like, this is an A, this is a B, this is a C. And I'd been using stuff like that previously when I wanted to do custom things. You know, like I would have some custom stuff and then I would be lazy and I would use a loop, you know, like here's a good break. And, 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 uh, and this is all legal, you know, this is all how this works. But, um, but it's, it's difficult to do because uh, you're not really like playing a song as it moves in tempo. You're trying to lay down everything and then you listen to how it sounds and then you have to tweak the, uh, the pitch maybe if it didn't come out quite how you wanted. And so it's kind of tedious, it takes a while to set up. It's not super convenient. Sony Asset is really designed for looping. Um, so what Studio One is gonna let me do is it's gonna let me actually compose stuff in real time. Like I can just use my computer keyboard to play as though it were like a, an actual keyboard. Or if I wanna go out and buy a, but like maybe a little bit down the line, I'll buy myself a piano keyboard and I can actually hook this up to my computer with the USB and I can just play keyboard directly into Studio One and record that and, and make my own music. 
Um, so for example, coming up on the next Gym of the Romantic Journey, you're going to hear a fully custom sound, uh, soundtrack that I composed. Um, I used some drums uh, that, I, that I had a loop for. Um, but other than that, other than that, like the all the instruments are just stuff that I composed with this this software. But while I was using the software, like uh, I was just I was just brought back to a time back when I used to be in band in high school, sitting there trying to keep keep in time with the metronome and everything like that, and not quite hitting on time. This is this is terrible. It's like I spent so many years in band, and to come back to this and to be trying to play music and able to make catchy sounding stuff but not really able to play quite in tempo as I wanted and then I have to go back and edit and move everything so that it's on tempo like it's just like oh the shame the burning shame I've forgotten so much so many things because music is in many ways easy and in many ways it's not easy it's it, it takes a great deal of muscle memory and practice and it's kind of funny because like the chord progressions can be simple enough. Like if you want to make a catchy song and you know a little bit about chord progressions, it's not too hard. Um, but being able to play that and kind of knowing, like I say, it's it's not hard, but it's not easy, and it's certainly time consuming one way or the other. And and the worse you are at music, the more time consuming it's going to be. So like myself, for example, I might be able to play a catchy tune. But because I uh, am, am crap at keeping tempo at the moment, and I'm gonna have to practice to get back at, to get good at keeping tempo again, um, like I play and I play my thing, I'm like, oh, that sounds catchy if it were on beat, and it's not. So then I have to go back and I edit. So I waste a ton of time editing these tracks to where it sounds on tempo, as opposed to you know, as opposed to being terrible. So this got me thinking about back in the old days when I was in band and I was still learning to play music. And, and like I say, I was in band back in middle school, um, but I didn't, I don't know how much I really learned in middle school. I mean, like one of the things, this is kind of comical, my teacher had a saying, it was like, when in doubt, fiddle about, I think was her saying. And that was like, if you can't play your song, just pretend to be playing <laughs> and, and no one will know. I mean, like, just play softly and everyone else will drown, will drown you out. And this is like terrible advice to give to someone in band. You shouldn't do this because uh, you'll find that a lot of times you are noticeable, even if you're playing softly, like the ear will catch that. And people like in the audience will be like, what is going on? Because it'll just sound like barf, you know, like it's just, it's musical barf. They hear that you're not playing on tempo or with anybody. I mean, we had people like this. In high school, I was in the drum section, the percussion section. And most of the time, I got stuck playing marimba. And, and I say stuck because what wound up happening, the way that my high school band worked, was that uh, everyone in percussion had to start with marimba. This was the default instrument. And I don't know why this was, but you had to audition for everything else. And if you were new, you pretty much you got stuck on marimba. No matter, you know, freshmen always got on, mari uh, on the marimba. So. Uh, they put me on marimba, and then what was funny was that everyone who was any good always wanted to audition off of the marimba, you know, which is, or a xylophone, it's like a xylophone, that's what the marimba is. It's a wooden, it's a wooden type of xylophone, so it's got a, it's got a softer sort of sound. It's got a more pretty sound than xylophone, in my opinion. Um, but it's a much larger instrument, and it's also a real pain in the ass to lug around the field. I mean, being in charge of the marimba, like, sure, you didn't have to march, but you had to load up this freaking, like, this giant, like, wooden wooden xylophone thing onto like a platform and then you had to drag the platform out. It was like heavy, it was a pain. Not everybody who would play marimba, I mean like I noticed other marching bands would sometimes just wheel the marimba out, you know, like without putting it on a platform, but we would load our marimbas onto like a platform. You have to lock down the marimba, you drag the platform out there. Like it was a huge pain. The marimba was just a, like a, I, I, I don't know, we were pit orchestra basically. I don't know whose idea it was to put marimba. But marimba though, you could play marimba in marching band and stay there and everyone else could just march around behind you. So uh, I got on marimba and I, I picked it up pretty quick. And so then what wound up happening is for the rest of my career in band, the rest of my time in marching band, they wanted me to stay on marimba because I picked it up really quick. And this was funny because there was another girl who had come from another instrument. She could already like read music so she could sight read really well. And, uh, and so they kept trying to get her to stay on marimba. They were like, oh, you're really good. Do you want to stay on marimba? And she was like, no, I want to play snare because it's a more prestigious instrument. And it's not really. I mean, like snares is its own sort of set of complications. Playing on the, playing on the marching line with the snare, uh, gosh, it takes a lot of precision and a lot of practice. I mean, any instrument takes a lot of practice, but it's, it's, it's kind of unique. It's not like a lot of other instruments. 
it's it's there's a lot of visual show if you play snare as much as anything else. I mean, like you watch people spin the sticks and and do all kinds of interesting things with the sticks. There's 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 a fair amount of visual stuff going on. Um, so anyway, so she's like, yeah, snare's more prodigious, and they were like, you, you know, not not really. I mean, we'd really appreciate to have some more people who can actually play marimba beyond marimba. Um, so yeah, so like I would audition for other things, and they'd be like, yeah, your audition was okay, but I think we're gonna keep you on marimba, Greg. And I'd be like, oh, okay, great. And so it was really frustrating because I got so many mixed signals, because you kept getting this like, yeah, all the new people go on marimba, but Greg, you're doing really good. You ought to try out for like the state band. And I'd be like, <laughs> what are you doing? Like, why? What are you? I can't. I can't understand this. I mean, I was in high school. How was I supposed to? How? Like. I, I'm still trying to understand myself and and deal with the opposite gender and everything else. This is all very confusing. Uh, yes, but but anyway though, I learned music and so this is one of the nice things is that this program, they kind of everything is sort of done through a keyboard and so I kind of get this keyboard and I look at it and a marimba or a xylophone, it's basically just a keyboard except for you play it with mallets except for with your fingers. So I'm kind of looking at this program and it's all just it's all just coming back to me. And I'm not any good because I'm so out of practice, but it's, you know, the skills the skills are there somewhere in the vestiges of my memory, and I'm going to have to practice them again. But, but it's all coming back. Uh, but the band, though, the marching band was good times. It was a very social thing for me. I never took it too seriously back in the day, but it was a great way to meet friends, and it was a good extracurricular activity. The trouble that we had, though, is our drum line went through drum instructors just left and right. I mean, like, every year it seemed like someone was getting fired or moving on to a new position. Uh, the first year we had a guy who was actually, he kind of liked the drill instructor thing, and he was really funny. He's actually the source of the tagline for Don Somewhere. It's always Don Somewhere. Uh, what happened was we, we all showed up at night to a drum rehearsal, and, uh, and he walks in and he goes, Good morning, everybody. And then someone goes, It's night. And then he goes, it's always morning somewhere, and then he punished us, he made us do push-ups. And he punished us all the time, he punished us for everything, and so it was kind of a comedy, working with this guy, learning from this guy, because he would tell us to do things, and then we would do them wrong, and then he would punish us. But he, was, he would always have like a really good sense of humor about it, he would tell jokes, and it was sort of fun, and so it wound up being very casual. But if you weren't serious about band, you wouldn't suffer through the punishments. And so the drumline actually worked pretty well. I mean, we were silly and we joked a lot. The culture was very, uh, was very loose and very fun. But we, we were still like, you know, focused and active and we played a lot and, and it was fun. Uh, the trouble was that this guy though then decided to move along. And so the next year he was gone. And the following year we had a guy who was a bit of a hard ass on everything. And I don't know what it is, he was a young guy, he'd just gotten out of college, I guess he had something to prove. And he was just really hard on everybody. I mean like, we'd gotten used to being kind of like jokesters and not really taking things seriously. Like as long as you showed up on time and you practiced enough and you were doing good, like everything was good. But this guy didn't really like the jokes. He didn't, he didn't want to be amusing or anything like that. And, uh, and we just didn't like him. He wasn't any fun at all. And then he started making comments, like he was actually also teaching another school. And he went to that school and he made some, some suggestive comments about one of the girls on our drum line. And the trouble was that this girl that he was making comments about was actually very social. And so she had friends from this other school. So word got back to her that this guy was like, you know, talking about how hot she was. And so he got fired. That was it. That 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 lasted for one year. Uh, you know, so that that was not the most fun time. And then for the third year, we had this really kind of like very quiet drum instructor. She was a really nice lady. I mean, she was good at music. She was really nice, but we had trouble. Where like when our first drum instructor was in charge, people would show up and they would just be completely stupid, and then they would get punished all the time because every time somebody said something stupid we get punished. And so sometimes people took advantage of it. They would say things, they would say stupid things on purpose explicitly to get the whole drum line punished because they thought it was funny. But it would all be a joke to us. So, you know, like it'd be like, oh, it's a stupid thing. And then we'd all get punished. Um, but the trouble is that by this third year, what would happen is we'd get people who would come in and they were legitimately stupid. Like that was, that was not too long after the movie Drumline had come out featuring Nick Cannon. And what Drumline was about was this super individualistic uh, uh, savant 
join the drum line and he could learn how to play drums. He could just hear a, a song and after he heard the song, he would know how to play it like by ear. Like he could just play it perfectly by ear after hearing it one time. And so this was the story. And it was all about like this, they were doing all this badass stuff and this guy was just, he just knew how to play like off the bat. And it was very silly because uh, a marching band drum line, it's really all about precision with other people. I mean, you're supposed to be, you know, forming marching patterns and things like that. And like I say, there's a lot of visual stuff on the snare drum, and everybody's supposed to be kind of doing the same thing. And this is where a lot of the thrill comes from, is you see everybody doing a bunch of like really interesting stuff with the sticks and moving around, or if they do a dance move, you know, everybody's supposed to do it simultaneously, and it winds up looking cool. So this movie about Nick Cannon being a lone badass wolf, you know, learning to deal with everybody else, for the most part, he was a terrible, he was, a ter he was maybe a great drummer, but he was a terrible guy for a drum line because he didn't learn any of the routines and he couldn't cooperate with anyone and you know really he was just crap and everybody would have hated him because he would have ruined every show that he was a part of. Um, he was a terrible marching band drummer. So we had a guy who come in and he wanted to play like drumline. He had been inspired by drumline so what he wanted to do was he wanted to screw around and be like real cocky like you could tell he was trying to he was trying to imitate Nick Cannon because he was doing some of the same bits that that movie had done. And this was what was really frustrating, is like we'd all seen the movie Drumline. I mean, like we were on a Drumline, of course. Of course, I'm pretty sure that we had a day where we actually sat down and we watched the movie Drumline. And so we were just like watching him do these bits from Drumline. And everybody knew it, like we'd all seen the movie. The whole, the whole Drumline had seen the movie. And so we were just watching this guy like do these bits. And we were like, you know, you complete dumbass. But uh, he, he never learned anything, this particular guy. And he was just frustrating. And, and our drum instructor was too nice to really tell him to knock it off. So he was just a real drag. I mean, like, he would, he would sit in the back and he would play off tempo and he wouldn't practice. And, and he would screw around while we were supposed to be practicing. Like, he just wasn't taking things seriously. And, and because she, I mean, she was super nice, our drum instructor was super nice, but she just, she just couldn't get like a firm grip on us. And so as soon as someone like that would start screwing around and they would lose interest, like everything would be lost. And I remember like, there was another guy, and this guy I was actually kind of friends with. He was sort of funny, but he was just really terrible at drums. I mean, like we would sit there and like we would play, like I didn't always play marimba. I mean, like sometimes I would play snare and stuff like that and I would be able to play snare, maybe like this other guy would be playing snare as well. And he was really, really bad at tempo. So he would be like, he would play for a little while and he would try, and then he would get frustrated and he would just start hacking, like he would just, he would just get mad. And so like, you're supposed to keep practicing, you know, we'd be at this for like three straight hours. And so the drum instructor would be like, you know, okay, you're way off tempo, can we try again? And what they used to do, every single year, every single drum instructor, they would bring out this metronome hooked up to a loudspeaker, and we would have to stand directly in front of it, and they would just blast it, you know, for, for like 120 beats, to, 120 beats per minute for three hours, just blasting this metronome into our ears. And so this was the thing that was really coming back to me as I was like listening to the metronome, and I was just like, oh, man. It was like shell shock, PTSD. I, I remember, I remember when they did that, because... Because that second year when we had that guy who was just who just had problems, I mean like, God, you would sit there, he wouldn't even turn the thing off, he would just shout at us over the metronome. And so like there's all kinds, I have as many bad memories as I have good memories It's associated with that metronome. Um, yeah, so we would just sit there standing in front of this metronome, and you could hear like, my friend on the right would be playing way off tempo. And by a certain point, about halfway through, halfway through drum instruction, he would get frustrated and then he would like be like, okay, here we go again. And then instead of trying to play the piece that we were supposed to play, he would just start playing his own thing entirely. Like he would just start, you know, it was the when in doubt fiddle about thing. And he was, he would just start wailing on the drum, you know, like not really paying attention because he was, he was frustrated. He didn't want to do it anymore. We just ruined the song. And so like pretty soon, I mean, like everyone would just be frustrated. It'd be like, cause, cause it's like when you got someone doing that, it's so hard to maintain your own precision because people around you playing off tempo, they can also kind of catch you. This is the thing about playing in a band is if you got like if the guy on your right is playing slightly off tempo, you'll feel compelled to adjust and kind of follow his tempo. And if the whole band starts to sort of shift into the wrong tempo, sometimes even the conductor is forced to sort of 
like conduct at the wrong tempo it's awful like like a little bit of bad musician musicianship can really ruin a band it's 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 phenomenal it's very fascinating And this is actually a reason our high school had two bands. We had the serious band and we had the okay you're in it for social reasons band. And I was always in the okay you're in it for social reasons band. And in fact a lot of people were. There were some really skilled people who were in the social band because they they would be good. Like you know they'd be they'd be capable of picking stuff up, but they really didn't want to go to all these state competitions and things like that. They really just kind of wanted to be in an extracurricular and meet people, you know, like you made a lot of friends. A lot of lady friends that I met were in band. Or you'd meet like a lady friend and then you'd meet her other friends that weren't in band. And so, you know, this is this was a good way for me to meet girls back when I was in high school. So that way I could completely screw up relationships with girls. This is really one of the things. This was the core thing that I did uh, was I met girls and then ruined relationships with girls until I eventually figured it out. And uh, and then it would, you know, like the figured out the friendship thing. That was the way to go. You make friends and then you date as opposed to like just, uh, uh, you know, all the other mistakes that you make when you're young. Um, but anyway, though, so there was originally it was set up that you had to volunteer for the serious band because in the serious band, they only wanted people who were serious and who were really motivated to be in the serious band. But then the the uh, teacher, our band teacher, left for a higher paying job because she'd done a really good job of organizing and managing this band. And uh, and so another another school was offering her a raise to come and teach their band instead. So she got up and she moved to a better school district and she left us with the with the prior assistant. And the assistant he he was he took music very seriously. I mean, he was a phenomenal horn player. The guy could play trumpet like nobody's business. But the trouble was is that he didn't really appreciate the people who were in the band just for social reasons, who were there just kind of kind of because they liked instruments, but also because they liked people. You know, he wanted everybody to be taking music very seriously, and he wanted the the serious band to be like, you know, all our best players are there. Because what had happened in the past was that you'd have some really good people who wouldn't audition for the serious band, and so there wouldn't be enough applicants, the more serious band would be a little bit smaller, you know, and they'd be forced to just take whoever was best. So the serious band wouldn't always wind up with the best players, they'd just wind up with the people who wanted to be in the most, the serious band. And so what this, what this new guy started to do is he made it to where trying out for the serious band was mandatory. You had to. And so then you got the you got the trouble where you had people who didn't really they didn't really want to be in the serious like competitive band and so they wouldn't like practice for the auditions or they would do it. But like our teacher knew who was good at the instruments. So what was awful was that like even if they would go in there and they wouldn't practice seriously and they wouldn't take the audition seriously, they would get roped into the serious band anyway because our teacher would be like, yeah, no, I've seen him play. I know he's good. I know that he intentionally flubbed the audition. So he would just pick him up and move it. Like, like I remember there was a guy who was really mad because he's like, I intentionally screwed up that audition and he still put me in the serious, in like the, the other band, the AP, I think they called it AP band, advanced placement band. He goes, they still put me in the, in the AP band. He's like, I tried to fail that audition and he just put me in there. So yeah, so we had some people who were kind of mad, that ruffled a couple of feathers. Um, and then there was a jazz band and the jazz band continued to be, continued to be uh, audition only, but that was because the jazz band was very small. I mean, like for jazz, you don't really need a whole lot of people playing at once. Um, and I don't recall, I might be mistaken, but I think that our, our, our teacher would even occasionally play horn along with that band because he was really good and he just wanted to keep playing horn. So he was a great musician, but I feel like he had the wrong mindset for, you know, music with kids. Because a lot of us, like I say, we just were in it for social reasons. We wanted to meet girls or girls wanted to meet boys. We wanted to go travel, you know, from time to time. I mean, we went to London. Our band actually played in the London Parade. This was a lot of fun. Um, I mean, there were a lot of rules because the last time our band went to London, some kids climbed out on the balcony so that they could sneak into each other's rooms to have sex. And, and so suddenly there was, there was a lot of rules <laughs> about what you could do during the day. You had to be supervised. Like, I, I'm pretty sure there was a parent for every floor at least. I mean, they brought a lot of parents along for, this, for these trips because, uh, I mean, you took kids away to like, England and I, I believe the drinking age in England is 18 so a lot of kids got access to alcohol where previously they wouldn't and uh, and so it was it was a 
it was a bit tough to keep track of everybody. And I, I, I really would have, I'd like to go back to London actually. I think that London, the two best trips I've ever had abroad were to London and Berlin. Berlin because it was my first date with Kenza and we, we went to a lot of amazing places. And London because they've got so much stolen history all wrapped up and, and stored away. Uh, it's, it's actually pretty great. But I had horrible jet lag throughout the entire trip. I, I mean, like, it wasn't just me. They tried to keep everybody on a schedule. I mean, they tried to keep us busy so that we weren't, we weren't doing things like trying to sneak into each other's rooms while we were on the trip. Uh, you know, so, so, but, but because they were trying to keep us all busy, we never really had a chance to catch up on sleep. They were waking us up early, like, every single morning. And so I, I was just, I remember being highly disoriented a lot of the time. I actually went into the British uh, History Museum and went into their library and then sat down. And I remember this guard politely coming by just to check on me every now and then because I was nodding off. And I mean, like, you could tell that I was doing it. Like, I was just sitting there and then I was <laughs> nodding off. I was just too tired. I couldn't, I couldn't, like, do anything or go anywhere. I didn't want to go. So, like, he just kept coming back every now and then to make sure I wasn't, like, asleep. <laughs> and I never really totally fell asleep, but I just I just kept sitting there doing this, and every now and then I just see the guard come by to check on me, and then I, uh, like like I, yeah I don't know, but yes, high school band, fun times. Like I say, uh, I never thought that it would come back and be a skill that I would use, but the stuff that I learned, I mean like the um, oh the like the data that I could repeat still is still with me things about scales and uh, keys you know playing in keys and things like that uh, that that information is still stuck with me my body has forgotten everything it knew about playing music I, I know that's that's all gonna be a problem but on the bright side I found that it, it's not too hard to go back and actually start composing stuff um, it's it's not brilliant but it's it's workable and as I practice I'll get better at it and so we're gonna have more original stuff in our videos uh, because as I say, we've got these pirate companies out there, and uh, and it's just uh, it's going to be a real problem. Some of those things, I'm not looking forward to dealing with when Orchard Music starts to claim all my outros, because they're going to start doing it. And and Content ID, I mean YouTube just doesn't care. There again, it's the same thing. The same thing that's protecting Orchard Music is the same thing that's protecting YouTube. Nobody's going to be able to sue them for thousands of copyright violations if it's all just nickel and dime nonsense. So they're going to get away with it for a while. They have been getting away with it for a while. The Orchard Music has a long history of this, and uh, there's not really anything I can do about it. I sent them an email. I sent Sony. I sent Sony an email. I sent an email to the guy who originally published this song that they're using to claim the outro. I haven't heard back from anybody, so I'm. Like I said, I'm pretty sure the piracy is going to continue, and that's just the way it is. But, on the bright side, I'm picking up new skills, and uh, what can I say, in entertainment, learning new skills is always a good thing. So, uh, I don't know, I mean, Content ID may be a broken system, but on the bright side, it's encouraged me to grow as a person, I suppose. So, uh, so yes, I suppose that's it for today. Thanks for joining me, everybody. I will catch you all next time.